live from the Mandalay Bay Convention Center in Las Vegas. It's the Cube covering VMworld 2016. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem sponsors. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and John Walls. Well, good morning and welcome back to Mandalay Bay here at the Convention Center as the Cube continues its exclusive coverage of VMworld. I'm John Walls along with John Furrier. Glad to have you with us here for day three of our coverage. Great lineup of guests we have for you and one of those has joined us here, Paul Durzan, who's the VP of Product Management at HPE. Paul, good to see you this morning. Good to see you and thank you for having me. You bet. Um, well, tell us first off your feeling, your take on the show, the vibe you've had here for two, yep. three days now. It's kind of soaked in. What's your take? Yeah, no, it's a, a great show, pretty alive, so lots of Lots of good things happening. As you know, HP and VMware are pretty close partners, so I think it's really good for both companies. Yeah, you, you launched a, a hyper-converged product a little bit earlier in the year. Yep. Walk us through that a little bit. Tell us about you know, what new you're bringing to the table with that and what was behind that. Exactly, thank you. So, we focused on a few things. Number one, a lot of customers have asked for a hyper-converged experience on the DL380 because it's one of the industry's leading servers, right? A lot of people have it and they really wanted that hyper-converged experience on there. So we want to start with a really good hardware platform and start to build on it. And then the second thing we wanted to do is we want to make hyper-converge as simple as possible. So we focused on the user experience because um, the, the goal there was to allow people who didn't have a lot of skills to be able to do basic things. To, so people, the skilled workforce could do what they wanted to do and not the mundane tasks. So we made a nice GUI where wherever your mouse is, you can click on, drill down, get the information you need. We did things like incorporate the ability to create a VM in five clicks. So now you can go into this hyperconverged experience, create your virtual environment. You can actually update your infrastructure. So we wanted to extend hyperconverged from being kind of, kind of that software defined storage layer and bring the infrastructure into it. So with three clicks, you literally can go and update your infrastructure. So again, all designed to be easy. So we have been big fans of the converged infrastructure from going back to eight, went before HPE, HP. Yep. Um, you guys pretty much coined that term. But really the trend now, as David Floyd was pointing uh, post, uh, out on in our intro, was the trend around what VMware is showing here today is about all, everything being together in yes. hyper-converged. Yep. Because the network now has to be faster, everything else is getting faster. So this is really the, what customers are moving to. Yep. So we get that, and congratulations, you guys have a really great product. We're, there, we're all impressed with it. But I really want to get into the difference between what the Hyperconverge does. Yep. Because that's a great product. Yep. Everyone should look at it. But how does it fit into the new composable uh, architecture that you guys yep. have been talking about? Because I love that messaging. Are they together? Are they, they work together? Are they separate? Can you break that down for us? Sure, absolutely. So, so right now we view Hyperconverge as being on the path to composable, right? When you look at composable, again, hopefully everyone knows this, but there's three key features. There's how do I create a fluid pool of resources? How do I go and put a layer of software-defined intelligence over that and then have a unified API so you can control the full infrastructure? So when you look at Hyperconverged now, what it does is it brings in that software-defined storage layer and within our product, we've actually brought that together with one view. So you have the ability to go and provision your infrastructure, provision your storage. And over time, what I think you'll see is Hyperconverged and composable infrastructure starting to merge because again, Hyperconverged essentially has that foundation of creating composable pool or fluid pools of resources, and having the ability to go in and, and have the software-defined intelligence. Yeah, so composable, work. the way I understood it from HPE Discover when we did the Cube there, all the videos are on youtube.com slash siliconangle. Yep. Check out HPE Discover, we've got a zillion interviews out there around this one topic. <laughs> but I want to just break it down again because I want to make sure I understand it. Path to composable, that, does that mean that the hyperconverge is a requirement for composable, or is it one of the building blocks? Great, great question. So we view hyperconversion as being one of the building blocks and it will get you to where you need to go. Again, I see long term those things really intersecting and, and you can imagine them, them becoming one. Um, but right now, hyperconverge is a great path to start to get onto that path of composable or a great first step. So composable, would I see a true statement if I said, no, kind of dumbing it down, the messaging. Composable is an invisible infrastructure to the developer. Is that a fair, accurate I think that's assessment? That's very fair, yep. So basically, the the, you don't have to worry about where everything's sitting, you're just going at the resource pools, storage, compute, network, e and exactly. programming a DevOps-like Yeah, and you philosophy. get infrastructure as a code where you can have software now reach down and kind of yeah. hit these bare metal servers and automatically deploy them, and you don't really need that intervention when that, that provisioning happens. So infrastructure as a code is the agility, the cloud native. Exactly, exactly. So where are your customers with this path? Because this is really important, because I love that. I think that's going to yep. be the end state for hybrid cloud and be the foundation. 
what are customers doing right now? Where are they? If I'm a customer of HP, I might have older boxes. I might yep. have some Proliance from the old days or some stuff, kind of servers and stuff. Do I rip and replace? Is there extendability? How do I move to this fast? Yeah, so one of the nice things is we, we have a bridge between today and Composable, and that bridge is essentially HPE OneView. So OneView is that software-defined intelligence, and you know today OneView works on DL servers, it works on Blade system. So, so what OneView will do is it will abstract the personality of that infrastructure and give you the ability to have, have your higher level constructs, whether it's Salt Stack or Puppet or Chef Ransible, come in and program that infrastructure. Um, so that becomes that common element as you move from today to the future where it does the same thing now, except now you're going to have a more malleable underlying set of hardware to give you that composability. Well, what's the biggest thing that you've heard from customers? I mean, you're, you're on the product management side, so yep. you've got to look at the roadmap. Yep, absolutely. So you got to make, there's always those decisions that don't yeah. make it to the market and everyone's fighting internally. We should have this or that. What's the features that you guys have that, are, that you see coming that customers could, be, could expect? Yep. So, and, and obviously I can't talk too much about roadmap, but I can tell you philosophically, we know that simplicity and agility are key, right? So this, this hyperconverged experience we built on the 380 was again designed to be really, really simple. I think we talked to a lot of people in the press about it and people actually tried it said, wow, this actually is simple, right? That's some of the reaction we got. So I think you're going to see that simplicity going forward from HP. How do we make it as easy as possible to manage? And then how do we take this world of agility and make sure that that infrastructure is as, as agile as possible, and it can talk to the software above it so you can start to have this automated, no ops, invisible infrastructure world. Yeah, define agility here a little bit, because we, we hear about it a lot. Yeah. Um, I get, we get simplicity, right? You know, three yep. clicks, five clicks, great. I could do that, John could do that. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> well, I don't, maybe John could do it, I, maybe, maybe not me. But, but, but uh, agility within, within the workflow of, of different clients have different needs, different companies have different priorities, so yep. you know, how do you define agility? Yeah, so the way I look at it, especially in context of composable infrastructure, is when you have these fluid pools of resources, what you want to do is you want to give the application the exact footprint it needs, and then have the ability to ex expand or contract that footprint as it needs it. So you want to be able to, from the infrastructure, create a footprint from the, for the application as quickly as possible, ideally automated. So you do need some human intelligence to go and create that initial set of policy, but once that policy is created, you want an application to be able to come in reach down into the infrastructure, get the exact footprint it needs. When it doesn't need it anymore, you just disperse it back into the broader pool for the next application to get it. So your, your, time, your, your time to value or your time to get that service up running becomes as fast as possible because you can move quickly and you can create quickly. All right, so can you give me a real life example of that then? I mean, what would be something if I, I like you said, I'm, I'm trying to, to get up and running, I'm trying to take care of a task. Sure. Now I'm done with it, I want to move yeah. on, I don't need it anymore, so what would that be? Yeah, we have a, so we obviously work very closely with HPE IT and they have a great example of what they've done with our hyperconverged product and their development. So they're using a Docker environment, but on VMs. And it used to take them 28 days to provision the environment for their developer to, for their developer to get what they need. Um, again, because in the hyperconverged, you essentially press a button and you get the VM it needs. They, they put the right image on those VMs and they serve, up, they serve it up to the developers because we have role-based access. So the developers now come in and click the VM that it needs and they've gone from 28 days to provisioning the environment to two hours. Right, so it's this ability to go and get things up really, really fast and really, really simply that, that is what it's all about. Paul, talk about for a minute, uh, share with the audience your relationship with VMware. Obviously, you're a VMware um, uh, partner yep, at a absolutely. significant level. Yep. Um, you guys provision VMs in five clicks, as you said. Yep. This is a key part of it, so can you share the relationship? You guys, what kind of work you guys do together, the status of it, and, and uh, what, what it looks like going forward. Yeah, so VMware's obviously a very critical partner to us, and what we want to make sure is, we want to make sure we make things as easy as possible, um, either through what we're doing or through integrating into key partners like VMware. So, for example, if you look at what we do with OneView, if you're in vCenter, kind of in what I'll call the more traditional Blade System 3 part environment, you can go into Blade System, provision your servers, within that system, provision your storage and your volumes within that system, and then provision your VMs within that system and have everything up and running. Again, HPIT went from multiple days to hours to do this because we've integrated together. So a key construct for us is we always want to be able to accommodate the VMware stack where our 
customers want it, and we want to integrate as deeply as possible. And I think it's fair to say, you know, we're one of the more integrated partners they have, and that's a philosophy one we want to continue as we go forward. So I'm going to ask you the tough question, and this is sure. one that I think you guys have a good answer for now, or getting a better answer than it was a couple of years ago. Oh, like the way he sets you up you know, for that too. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, everyone knows about HP's cloud situation. Yep. They, they had a couple uh, misstarts. Uh, Bill Hill's no longer with the company, and they have now they're back to their roots of their clear strategy of basically what Pat's talking about, inter-clouding, or you guys don't call it cross-cloud, but HP's always said from day one, managed cloud was a big part of their philosophy. So, yep. you know, I got to give shout outs to the HP team. Thank managed you. cloud has been there from day one, they've never wavered. Yep. There's been some in initiatives that didn't work out, and same with VMware, by the way, so they're, they're, they're kind of built victims. But they say the clear data center path is, is there. So I got to ask yes. you, when a customer says, hey, you know, I got my, I'm an HP shop and I got some Dell and HPs and all this other stuff. I just want to go to the cloud. I'm going to go with Amazon. Yep. So maybe I'm going to move away from the HP because HP can't give me that cloud like agile experience. I'm sure this is where, this is the key to Composable. Talk about that, that nuance and that, that kind of statement uh, and clarify HP's position vis-a-vis -vis sure. offering that Absolutely. kind of roadmap to the cloud. Yeah, so I mean, we, we would agree, right? We all know the world, the world today is a hybrid world, and you have to be able to accommodate private infrastructure and public infrastructure. And in fact, the, the ideal is really to move between them based on a set of policy around economics or latency or locality or whatever, right? So that, that's exactly the viewpoint we have. How do you go and, and set policy up so you can broker across clouds and put applications where they need to? But obviously, if your on-prem isn't as efficient as it could be or not fully automated, then it will have a hard time struggling or, or competing against public. So what we want to do is make sure we bring this agility to on-prem and composable infrastructure is the foundation of that. So your on-prem can move as fast and as agile and get that public experience. And then you, know, you, then you use a higher set of pol policies to determine where do I go. So if someone says, oh, HP's late to the game, which by the way is not true, you've been doing the composable kind of, I'm yep. kind of teasing it up for you because I want yeah. you to explain, I hear the FUD on both sides. You know, HP yes. has no, no cloud, but you really do have a path to the cloud. We, we absolutely, you, thank you, yeah, sorry, we, we absolutely do, and in fact, what's interesting about HPE is we, we, have, we have two paths, because when you look at the enterprise, there really is this traditional and this cloud native. On the cloud native side, we have our, our Staccato and our, our Helium OpenStack, on the more traditional side, we have CSA and, and the software stack that goes along there. And then we have a, a, a service catalog like Propel that can link across them. So we can actually give you both that cloud native yes. and that traditional environment. And I think that's actually something really unique about HP because people either can't do the whole stack or they focus on one or the other. And there's no silver bullet too. I mean, one of the things I could say, go do all the Cube interviews, all the different shows, you know, there is an awesomeness around AWS, uh, but, but they're also trying to get into the enterprise, which it's essentially just Amazon and cloud and the yeah. enterprise. It's basically private cloud, for, but Amazon private cloud. You guys have the data center footprint, and again, access to the cloud. And it's complicated, it's complex either way. It, 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 it's, it's very complex. There's trade-offs, both yeah. functionality, performance, right? So you have, this is really the, the, the decision tree for the customer, right? It is, it is, and you know, we, we do believe that the future is how do I go and move across these clouds and how do I broker across them? But that is a very complex thing to do, and, and no one solved it fully, but I think we're, we're a good ways along. You know, we've heard a lot of predictions this week, right? That's what yeah. shows are all about. You know, people get on the stage and make these predictions. Um, in your world, the next 12, 18 months, so what do you see as being, you know, kind of like, this, this, is the, this is the trend that I, that I feel is coming on. This is what we're going to be addressing, and I think we're, our path to success. Yeah, so I think you know we, we talked about composable infrastructure and we talked about um, hyperconversion. I really see you know this not only this melding of forces, but how do I go and take this composability and make sure it can be automated or orchestrated? So it is really about this world of how do I get my policy around my application and drive that application onto my infrastructure with as minimal involvement as possible, so I can be as fast as possible. And I think we're going to actually start to see that happen in a much more robust manner. Well, Paul, thanks for being with us. Great. We appreciate the insight Thank and you. the time. Thank you, and, appreciate uh, the time And wish too. you continued success. Thank you, appreciate thanks it. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. The Cube coverage here at VMworld continues from Mandalay Bay in just a bit.